So now that we've looked at the details that are associated with the events that cause a contraction and what happens during contraction at a cellular functional level, let's conclude our look at the sliding filament theory by entitling the next flowchart Sliding Filament Model 3. So here we're going to now just come up with a couple of summative points that cover uh, a basic understanding of this process now that we know the nitty gritty details. So what I want to first highlight um, is something to remember and to keep in mind whenever you study this process. Remember that the myosin head, whatever state that it's in, dictates much of what is going on around and within the muscle cell. If the myosin head is in a low energy state, this means that the muscle cell is contracted or relaxed, means that it's relaxed because in a low energy state, ATP is attached to its associated ATP binding site on the myosin. Therefore, we state that in this moment, if it's relaxed, if it's in a low energy state with ATP attached, the muscle cell is relaxed. And uh, consequently, if we have a high energy state, that would mean that not only is ATP there, but ATP has to specifically be hydrolyzed. Keep that in mind. It's not just about having ATP there, it's about having ATP hydrolyzed to its subsequent components, to its two components that are of interest, ADP plus PI. Specifically, the inorganic phosphate is what has lots and lots of wound up energy within it. This puts the myosin head in a wound up stage, okay? In a wound up, non-relaxed stage. Um, this is also referred to as a cocked position. This is basically going to be when the muscle cell will contract. Okay, this means that contraction is about to happen, whereas this means that it's in a relaxed muscle cell state. So keep those in mind. It's very important. Anytime you see a low energy or high energy myosin head, be sure to associate with the correct events that um, are going to be prior to it and post the high energy and low energy state. So those are things to remember. Now, the one thing that's pretty important during this process is how it's uh, promoted. In essence, we have to ask ourselves, what is going to drive this entire process if you have all this ATP that's necessary? There's going to be a major question of an energy supply. How can you possibly do this at the rate that you do it? In essence, uh, we can state that the energy supply um, can be summarized by the following statement. I will tell you that whenever each head is going to create some sort of contraction event, during that contraction event, each head forms and reforms about 500 cross bridges a second. Let me repeat that. 500 cross bridges a second will form per second during any muscle movement, any muscle contraction. That's a lot of ATP being hydrolyzed. That's a lot of ATP being used. That's a lot of energy. So it's worth understanding what the energy supply is that allows this process to happen. So to reiterate, I think it's very clear that this all requires lots of ATP. Not just ATP, but it requires lots of ATP to break, to break cross bridges. Because if you want to go back to the relaxed state, remember, you need a new ATP molecule to float and go back onto its myosin binding site, its ATP binding site on the myosin head, I should state. So when this happens, this ensures that the cross bridge breaks so that the myosin head can return to a, what state? Return to a low energy state. That's what's going to happen when you have a new ATP come in and break this cross bridge that originally formed during contraction. Okay, So that would mean a low energy state is there. Interestingly, this is a topic of interest, I think, when you are looking at somebody who has died, actually, because... And I find this absolutely fascinating. This is really, really cool to me. Upon death, when the body dies, the body experiences something called rigor mortis. Okay? The body experiences rigor. This is a Latin term. Rigor mortis. What does that mean? And how does it relate to the sliding filament model? Basically, remember this. Look how we stated that you need ATP to break the cross bridges. But once you've died, you are no longer breathing. You are no longer respiring. 
you are no longer doing oxidative phosphorylation, if you want to be fancy, and making tons and tons of ATP. You've stopped making ATP because you're not breathing anymore. You don't have oxygen to be that terminal electron acceptor. Just summarize bio one for you, basically. But what's going to happen? What's the consequence of no breathing, no oxygen, no ATP? The consequence is that the cross bridges that are constantly forming and reforming, remember how I said 500 times a second? Those cross bridges upon that moment of death actually stay in place. They don't break because there's no ATP. They stay in place because there's no ATP to bind, no ATP to bind on to myosin head. And if there's no ATP to bind to the myosin head, the cross bridge cannot break. And if the cross bridge does not break, the cross bridge stays in place. And when the cross bridge stays in place, you experience this moment where all the muscles are incredibly tense. The moment of death, and for a couple of minutes afterwards, a couple of hours I should say afterwards, the body is very, very stiff. And that's because all of the myosin heads, all of the muscles, within a human body that were contracting at the moment of death, those muscles that you may not know of or may know of, all of them are going to freeze. They're going to stay in place because there's no ATP being made in the body because the body has died, and thus there's no cross bridges to break. You're going to have this myosin in this high energy state for a decent amount of time, um, and later on you'll break those cross bridges for reasons that we don't need to get into. The body does not stay stiff continuously. We don't need to get into the details of what happens post-death, okay? Enough talk about death. Um, the big statement that I basically want to uh, highlight here is that this event itself, rigor mortis, shows us that ATP as a molecule can't be stockpiled. Because what you would imagine is, you know, you think that ATP as the, you know, energy of life uh, would be put into our bodies in a high rate and stored all the time and stored everywhere within our body. But that's just not the truth. ATP, um, if you look at its size compared to other molecules within the body, it's a huge molecule and it simply cannot be stored within the human body. The human body was not made to store ATP. The human body specializes in making ATP, but if you die, you certainly do not specialize in making ATP anymore. So the end-all, be-all theme of this idea here is to tell you that ATP can't be stockpiled because you see rigor mortis in people who die because you see them unable to break these cross bridges and return to a low energy state because there's no ATP available, no ATP stockpiled, no ATP being made. So I think that's a very interesting statement here to really summarize how this energy supply is working.